It is my great pleasure to introduce the two honorary guests today. Um, Madhvi Murti is professor in feminist studies, and she has just received tenure also. So congratulations. And uh, we are here today to honor her, uh, the publication of her book, uh, Stories That Bind, Political Economy and Culture in New India. And the way this will be structured <laughs> is there is dialogic and presentation, and the respondent will be Professor Gina Den from Feminist Studies, also Legal Studies. Um, she's also a faculty fellow at the Institute of Arts and Sciences, and she herself had a book come out recently, yes. Abolition, Feminism, Now. <laughs> Thank so thank you so much for taking this on and for having or being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Juji. Uh, should I get started? Gina? Well, okay. I had I had um, Juji actually um, <laughs> help, but I actually read. I was about to read the bio that Monavi sent me this morning, Professor Murti, I should say, <laughs> and it said I am an assistant professor in the Department of Feminist Studies. With and it went on, and I thought. I was just going to bust you for not using your new title. Yeah. So um, first of all, I just, you know, uh, want to congratulate you Thank for you. that. Yeah. Thank you. Woo. Um, and I also want to say that in addition to your official bio, which we ha I have in front of me, which I could read more of, and maybe I will actually, just in case there are people here who um, don't know, um, I have a little more to say. Um, so as Professor Murti wrote, I am an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Feminist Studies with an affiliation in digital arts and new media and critical race and ethnic studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. My research and teaching interests center on popular media, nationalism, globalization, feminisms, post-colonial theory, cultural theory, and modalities of difference such as race, caste, and gender. My book manuscript focuses, manuscript, <laughs> <laughs> covers, <Yeah>. reviews, <laughs> done, uh, focus on the intertwined projects of Hindu nationalism and liberalism in India and their narration and popular culture. My professional experience as a journalist in Mumbai, India in the first few years of the new millennium informed the questions that define my research agenda. I really wanted us to hear that too. Previously, I worked as an assistant professor in the Department of Religion and Culture at Virginia Tech and as a lecturer at Yale University's Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies Department and the South Asia Studies Council. I have also taught at the University of Washington Bothell as a fellow in the Project for Interdisciplinary Pedagogy and was a research fellow at the UW Simpson Center for the Humanities. I know it's hard. <laughs> My work has been published in peer reviewed journals such as Science, Journal of Women in Culture and Society, Feminist Media Histories, and Popular Communication. I have a PhD in communication from the University of Washington, Seattle, and a master's in journalism and mass communication from the University of Minnesota. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I wanted us all to hear that because sometimes we have colleagues around and we honestly don't know all these things about them. So I, I think it's important for us to know that. But I wanted to say that we think of Professor Murti <laughs> as a, a generous, thoughtful, dedicated, and brilliant colleague who has given the department and this campus so very many things. And I myself have deeply appreciated all of the conversations we've had over many years about our students, about teaching, mm -hmm. and about research questions, and especially the way that you have helped me to think more deeply about how we should think about uh, parts of the world, such as India, and learn from that to think differently in how we reflect on uh, the issues at home. Mm -hmm. And I think your book is a really wonderful way mm -hmm. to set us up to do that work today. So thank you, Madhavi. Oh. <laughs> wow, <I'm, laughs> I don't know. Uh, this is this is very hard, actually. I don't like I don't like being in the center. Uh, you know, having the spotlight. My my ears are very very hot and red. Uh, but I'm gonna try and get through this. Um, I wanna thank you so much Gina for that that was that was lovely um, uh, I mean it was much more than lovely it was very very generous um, and thank you to Juji and uh, and Lisa for organizing this and getting this together uh, really in really quick time thank you all for being here in person um, it's just it's so wonderful to do this in person um, uh, after you know a really long time I don't think I've yeah, it's been, it must be at least three years since I've done 
uh, a presentation, uh, talked about my work in person. Um, but one of the wonderful things about Zoom is that my 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 lovely friends and uh, colleagues uh, from Seattle and different parts uh, of the US can join in too. I see Jennifer waving. <laughs> so that's, it's so nice to see all those lovely faces. Thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. So I'm gonna get started. Um, if you'll excuse me, I, uh, I'm gonna read. Uh, because I have a tendency to tell long and convoluted stories. Um, and so, I, you know, it's uh, reading <laughs> from written text um, allows me to, uh, to center uh, the points I want to make. I'm going to tell you stories, of course. The book is about stories. Um, but, uh, but, but reading the text might be, might be easier. Um, so let me begin. Um, let me actually... Should I... I have um, I have some, we don't need pictures for every single bit of what I want to say, but there's some visual accompaniment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oops, no, this is not. Yes. Thank you. So in the 1990s, um, I was a teenager living in the metropolis of Mumbai on the west coast of India when the world changed. Or so it seemed to me. A mosque had been demolished by a Hindu mob. Mumbai city burnt. Computer science and information technology were all the rage. The Miss World beauty pageant came to India a few years after the introduction of Pepsi and Coca-Cola. The television screen pulsed with new images, new sounds and new voices as state control of the airwaves loosened. The first Gulf War played itself out in grainy green imagery on the screen in the living room. We heard that a black man named Rodney King had been brutally beaten by the police and we saw images of the Los Angeles riots. We didn't know who O.J. Simpson was necessarily, but we saw images of the police chasing his white bronco. And later we stayed up very late, or did we wake up very early uh, to hear that he was found not guilty of murdering his ex-wife and another man on those newly liberated airwaves. A few years later, we saw the US President Bill Clinton write a zero against the federal budget deficit on those same screens and heard about Tony Blair in the UK and his new Labour Party. At home, the Indian national muscle was flexed through nuclear tests, Hindu pride was aggressively articulated, and caste-based affirmative action policies were violently contested. Economic liberalization had become a key phrase. Brands were everywhere, and the erstwhile angry young man, the man of the city streets, the working class hero of the Hindi cinematic screen, Amitabh Bachchan, appeared in the advertising campaigns of many of those brands. It was a bewildering time that I experienced as a knot, a node of tangled threads and provocations of all manner of hues. In the first decade of the new millennium, as I became an adult and now lived outside the nation of my birth, that temporal and spatial node only grew more tangled. Or so I thought. Economic liberalization or neoliberalism about which there had been strife ambivalence and debate in the 1990s had consolidated itself in India and indeed around the world. India was deemed renewed. It had emerged. The Indian national press informed me. Hindu nationalism that defines India as a Hindu nation was also strengthened. In fact, in 2014, the, the right-wing Hindu nationalist Bhartiya Janta Party or the BJP, the political unit of the larger Hindu nationalist movement, won a majority of seats in the Indian general elections and formed the government. Narendra Modi, who as chief minister of the Western Indian state of Gujarat, had aggressively narrated Hindu and Gujarati pride, became prime minister. In the story he tells about himself, Modi is an outsider to the elite upper caste political establishment that has governed India since independence from British rule in 1947. In 2019, the BJP won a resounding majority again and came back to power. Modi, having consolidated his power both within his own political party and within the broader political discourse, is prime minister once again. Modi's ascent to power is not a story of in, about Indian exceptionalism. A global conjuncture was taking shape. 
the specificity of the Indian story brings into relief the complex articulations of a conjuncture that is global in shape. India resides within this conjuncture, not as an exception, but as a significant geopolitical node. The listing of electoral successes around the world, Europe, North America, Latin America, and Asia over the last decade in particular, highlights the electoral defeat of the left and the, con and the concomitant emergence of a form of right-wing political discourse that enables the consolidation of global capitalism, articulates religious conservatism, is Islamophobic, xenophobic, and anti-immigrant more generally, is anti-Black, anti-LGBTQ, and misogynistic. This globally dominant political discourse is embodied by a form of hypermasculinity that claims outsider often victim status for itself and narrates itself as a reflection of the people. This then is the story of our time. It is a story that gives form to a global conjuncture. My book is about the form neoliberalism takes in India. It is about Hindu nationalism and its form and the popular stories which give form to their conjugation Hindutva neoliberalism. It makes two arguments. First, it reveals the conjoining of neoliberalism with authoritarian nationalism. I contend that this binding is not a function of coincidence, but is the consequence of shared narrative strategies of both Hindu nationalism and neoliberalism. Second, I suggest that the intersection of neoliberalism and Hindu nationalism has an aesthetic form, and I label it spectacular realism. Let me be clear. I'm not arguing that the political right wing in India in the form of Hindu nationalism or neoliberal capital has been more effective or successful at crafting narratives. I'm arguing that capital and authoritarian nationalism have given themselves a local, intimate, familiar form through popular aesthetics. Its form gives capital and authoritarian nationalism an intimately familiar shape and wins them consent. Unlike the form accorded to both neoliberalism and Hindu nationalism by their critics, which suggests well-formed articulated projects that intervene in defined areas in planned strategic maneuvers, I argue that neoliberalism and Hindu nationalism constitute themselves or give themselves form through an immersion in the textual, visual, and sonic sign systems of popular culture. Instead of conceiving the story as epiphenomenon or the unreal ideological facade that obscures and obfuscates the reality of political economic formations, I think about the story as the paradigmatic structure through which political economic formations narrate themselves. Stories have a world-making function. Defining Hindu nationalism and neoliberalism as intersecting political projects, I examine the cultural forms these projects use to narrate themselves and track their intersection in their conception of the categories people and development. Stories are therefore the archive, and the story is also a heuristic device for the book. So even as I read the stories that political parties and their campaigns tell, that corporations narrate, that films, advertising, journalism, and commentary circulate, I track, discover, and explore the story, the story that emerges from these many narratives. My assumption is that the story and its form informs us about the making of the temporal and spatial node within which we live. Some of the questions then that the book poses are, what is the relationship between neoliberalism associated as, as it is with globalization and authoritarian nationalism linked as it is with nativism? How is this relationship forged? So let me tell you a story that begins to address these questions. In 1991, the Indian National Congress or the INC, the political party associated most particularly with anti-colonial nationalism, Jawaharlal Nehru, who is independent India's first prime minister, M.K. Gandhi, and until the 1980s, the single largest political party with a national footprint was in power. Manmohan Singh of the INC, finance minister of India at the time, laid out the infrastructure for a set of economic policies that came to be euphemistically labeled as economic liberalization and tied India's political economy more intimately to global capital. The reforms included prescriptions like devaluing the currency, initiating policies that attracted greater foreign direct investment, resulting in the increased visibility of consumer products in the Indian market. The Congress labored to tell the story of economic reforms as a story about continuity with change. 
they insisted that economic liberalization was in line with the vision for the nation envisaged by those who led the anti-colonial nationalist mobilization against the British. In a long preamble to a document outlining the industrial policy reforms the finance ministry and the prime minister's office were seeking, the new policy was genealogically linked to Jawaharlal Nehru, again, independent India's first prime minister. A policy that would abolish the requirement for industry to seek clearances under the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act of 1969 or the MRTP Act of 1969 was narrated within the preamble to the cabinet note as inspired by, and I quote, the goals and objectives set out for the nation by Pandit Nehru on the eve of independence, namely the rapid agricultural and industrial development of the country rapid expansion of opportunities for gainful employment, progressive reduction of social and economic disparities, removal of poverty and attainment of self-reliance." The preamble went so far as to suggest that the industrial policy resolution of 1956 was the fountainhead, the original vision statement on which the new economic and industrial policy was shaped. In this story, economic liberalization was linked patrilineally to anti-colonial nationalism, and the fervor of the newly independent state. It was articulated to the heady task of nation building. It also did the work of winning consent of a cabinet with many trepidations at the time. P. V. Narasimha Rao, Prime Minister of India in 1991, traced an even longer genealogy when speaking in the lower house of parliament in July of that year and later in his writing as well. Quoting from a Sanskrit Subhashita, which is a, a, a short epigram that contains a message typically in the form of a maxim, Rao asserted that the economic reforms initiated by his government had, quote unquote, salvaged the prestige of the nation because, and here I'm quoting, the wise and the, uh, the, the Sanskrit term, the term he used, quoting from this uh, maxim, Sanskrit maxim, was pandit. Now, Pandit can be translated to mean um, the learned one, wise, right? but it is also a caste term because only Brahmins can be Pandits. Right? So as in, in, a, in the previous quote, um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Pandit Nehru, right? Uh, uh, so it's, it's only Brahmins who can, so it's also a caste term, but it can be, of course, translated to mean learned people, the wise one. Yeah. So Rao says, uh, the wise or the pundit or the Brahmin, when faced with untenable circumstances, find a way out by giving up half of their possessions, end quote. Such a move av avoids complete destruction and the wise or the Brahmins can thus use the salvaged half of their possessions prudently to win back all they had lost. Referencing the fiscal crisis and the controversial decision to devalue the currency, as well as liberalize certain sections of the economy, Rao eschewed their modern provenance in political economic theory and linked such policy decisions to Brahminism and articulated it to an ancient national culture. The nation here was also feminized and the policy makers, i.e. the embodiment of the state, were masculinized as her sons who had strived to maintain her honor and prestige. The patrilineal linkage to Nehru and the ancient Brahmins was a piece of this larger narrative that reproduced the nation and the state in familiar gendered sign systems. To use Peng Che's evocative phrase here, there was a surfeit of culture in this narration of economic liberalization. Let us think some more, though, about this inaugural story of economic liberalization, because it establishes a very significant link between liberalism and Brahminism that it defines as indigenous and native. That link is crucial to the intersection of Hindu nationalism and neoliberalism. Political theorist Ajay Gudavarti has argued that liberalism allows for incremental change accommodating dissent so that dissent doesn't flower into a radical challenge to social and institutional hierarchies. More importantly, liberalism centering of the individual and its conceptualization of freedom as the capacity to separate from social collectives, such as caste and class-based communities, engenders the spatial and social segregation of the same collectives. Liberalism's philosophical tenets underline freedom in their discourse and in practice effect segregation and separation along the lines of social and economic hierarchies. Gudavarti has argued that Brahminism similarly 
is, and I quote, essentially a philosophy of separating and segregating social collectives along caste by birth, and that it co-opts and accommodates moments that emerge in opposition to it and tones them in its own color, end quote. Tracing the history of the domestication of the English language, the language of colonialism in India, gender historian Shifali Chandra has also tracked the history of the amalgamation of liberalism with Brahminism. Chandra's work shows us that battles that were waged around the domestication of the English language in the late 19th and early 20th centuries exacerbated caste-based hierarchies and served to Brahminize Indian culture. Narrating economic liberalization as continuity with change, as the INC did, was thus in line with the central tenets both of liberalism, but also Brahminism. More importantly, the INC sought to win consent for neoliberalism by narrating it as indigenous, as emerging from the cultural soil of the nation itself. In order to do so, it narrated the nation and its culture through Hinduism, caste, specifically Brahminism, and gender. What was established early in the story of economic liberalization was the significance of the Patchy Line and an embodiment that emphasized caste and masculinity linked to the nation. Even when other elements of this original story about economic liberalization were disavowed, for instance, the connection to Nehru yeah, was, was uh, later completely disavowed, um, the suturing of patriarchal nationalism, caste, and neoliberalism remained in place. The story of the intersection of neoliberalism with Hindu nationalism is in fact a story about masculinity, aggrieved, obstructed, incomplete, aggressive, and on the move, spectacularized into authority. And this is one of the lines, three thematics that the book attempts to trace. Attendant to feminism's call to be vigilantly self-reflexive of the epistemological and conceptual categories we use ourselves and how those might enable and disable certain social formations, my specific interest here is to examine culture's imbrication with political economy through the heuristic device of the story. I expressly do not turn to culture, therefore, to critique the essentialism of political economy. Because as cultural theorists like Robert Young have shown us, the genealogies of culture and race are deeply imbricated and intertwined with the political economy of colonialism and colonial desire. There is no safety, therefore, in culturalism. Moreover, culture often becomes encoded as the feminized appendage to masculinize political economy. It would, be, it would not be unfair to say that popular culture is in fact constituted as the feminine other of masculinized political economic projects. My intervention here is to trouble this ossified and gender disciplinary and methodological mind. I therefore read political economy as a story too, as a story about our time. I read it for the science systems it deploys, the narrative strategies it uses, and the affective story it aims to tell. And most importantly, I read both the popular cultural story as well as the story political economy narrates to interpret its form. The attention to stories allows us to intervene in that conjuncture by imagining different ways of telling the stories about our time. Culture's co-belonging with politics means eschewing, I think, the epistemological binary that conceptualizes culture as either resistant or as ideology. This epistemological binary assumes the culture of the state and the political institution as ideology and the culture of the people as radical, resistant. I think instead about culture as the story, the paradigm that gives form, that makes sensible or tangible politics, economics, development, nation, and the people. I envisage stories as the medium that gives form to economic and political instances, and as the sutures that link these diverse instances together into a complex unity or structure. Stories, therefore, are not reflective of the economic or the political in the last instance. Instead, they are assumed to be constitutive. As such, stories do not represent a false consciousness. Instead, they are the only modality through which we attain, maintain, and reinforce consciousness itself. Sailor Ben Habib has argued, in fact, that culture presents itself, and I quote, through narratively contested accounts, and that to be and to become a self is to insert oneself into webs of interlocution. It is to know how to answer when one is addressed and to know how to address others. Stories are a significant terrain, therefore, of political struggle. They are the ground on which hegemony is attained, struggled over, and reinforced. Stories work to express political projects in ways that will win consent. Stories are complex, unstable scripts, themselves encoding several different stories into a contingent unity. 
So having defined stories in, in that manner, uh, let me now tell you three stories. Um, a story drawn from popular culture, a story about Hindu nationalism, and a story about neoliberalism and global capital as a way to narrate the form that brings Hindu nationalism and economic liberalization together. Here, through a reading of these three disparate stories, I want to define the contours of the narrative form that I'm calling spectacular realism. While I reveal the shapes or attempt to reveal the shapes, lines, and curves of spectacular realism in each of these stories, I want to emphasize that it is only through the methodological maneuver of reading them together and consistently holding the three stories within a single analytical frame that the form itself comes into relief. So let's begin. In the hugely popular, this is the, the first story drawn from popular film. In the hugely popular 1987 Hindi film, Mr. India, directed by Shekhar Kapoor, the nation comes to be embodied by a commoner, specifically a common man. This arm Hindustani, common Indian, ekes out a living by teaching the violin. Often himself, he is the caretaker of and bhaiya or brother to a group of orphans who live with him and his friend Calendar in an old decrepit home he rents from a ruthless landlord. He struggles to make the rent and pay the bills to run the house each month. The ordinariness of Arun Parma, our common Indian, is emphasized through the ill-fitting sport coat, trousers, an unpressed stained shirt, and a misshapen hat that he wears through the length of the film. It, also, it is also represented through both his guileless voice, as well as his quiet dignity in the face of the many tribulations he, is, he endures. What transforms this common man into Mr. India is a device that was invented by his scientist father, which when activated renders its user invisible to the eye. Arun Bhaiya is thus an everyman, because as an orphan who appears to know very little about his parents, he is ostensibly unmarked by the patriarchal family's investments in class and caste lines. But he's also the man. Mr. India, via an invention that belongs to him through the patch line. The film literalizes the invisibility of the commoner. He is unremarkable, unnoticeable, one in a mass, and transforms it into a superpower. When literally invisible, the commoner Arun Barma is transformed into the superhero, Mr. India. The film pits Mr. India, the invisible common man, against a... Uh, this is Arun Barma romancing the, his heroine. Um, but the, the film pits Mr. India, the, uh, the invisible common man, against a spectacular supervillain. Um, <clears throat> Mugambo, the antagonist, is an overdetermined embodiment of evil. He alludes to fascism, specifically Hitler, is invested in territorial conquest. He foments and encourages violence along religious and caste lines. And he's invested in corrupt capital and drug and arms smuggling. He's a misanthrope who enjoys watching his subservient lackeys leap into a vat of acid. His Mephistophelian co costume in red, black, and gold, his garish makeup and hair, his menacingly booming laugh and catchphrase, where he speaks about himself in the third person, Mogambo Kushwa, that makes Mogambo happy, all work to transform him into both comic book evilness and spectacular supervillain. Let me just, because this is so iconic, um, I have to, <laughs> I have to, thank you, Lisa. I have to play. I hope you can hear this. Mogembo. Kushu. Mogembo. Kushu. Okay, that's yeah. So that's that is the that's the catchphrase. Um, Um, yeah, Mogambo Kushua, that makes Mogambo happy, all work to transform him into comic book evilness and a spectacular supervillain. Mr. India, the film, makes two significant narrative and representational moves that are central to the story that my book uh, aims to tell. First, the film defines commonness or the commoner 
through heteronormative masculinity that is nevertheless subdued, unheroic, unremarkable, and mundane, and articulates or link this links this narration of commonness to realism. To narrate in the modern form of, near, of realism, Mr. India suggests, is to tell the story of the unheroic, invisible common man, dressed in unremarkable clothes, unshaven and sans makeup, much like the real middle class or lower middle class, middle to upper caste arm in Hindustani. Realism as a form, as opposed to the melodrama or the romance, for instance, here connotes demystification and an so connotes uh, demystification and an intimacy with sociological, cultural, and historical detail. In other words, the character of Arun Varma can be read as realistic, not because he is lifelike necessarily, but as a consequence of conventions that define realism as the narration of sociological details and an embodiment of unremarkable, unheroicness. Sociological details render Arun Varma a commoner. As a common man, he is the antithesis of the larger-than-life hero, and his embodiment does not encode a metaphysical or transcendental meaning. As such, he is real, and through him, the narrative alludes to realism. But two, but Mr. India does more. Cinematically, the film links this particular investment in realism to the narration of that which is spectacular. In other words, the film links realism to sensationalist drama and indeed the distinctly unreal. Arun Barma may be unremarkably real, but Mr. India is sensationally unreal, spectacular, and literally invisible. Mr. India and Mugambo are larger than life. They come to embody mythic conceptions of good and evil, and as such, they are spectacularly in excess of the conventions of characterization deemed necessary by sociology, history, and ethnography. We can thus define the narrative form of Mr. India as spectacular realism. To be clear, realism here is defined as the simple and simplistic enumeration of sociological, cultural, and historical detail through textual, visual, and sonic signifiers. These would include costume, makeup, or the lack thereof, spatiality in entailing shooting on location rather than on a set, referencing or alluding to known and established historical events, using local dialects, slang, colloquialisms in dialogue, and starting from the new millennium, increasingly shooting with in-sync sound rather than dubbing the dialogue over the visuals. While Mr. India is set in the metropolis of Mumbai, realism as a form has in fact come to center the small town upper to middle caste male, particularly in cinema in the new millennium. This form of realism is associated with modernity itself and the coming into maturity of both the nation and its predominant storytelling processes. The spectacle or the spectacular harkens to the tradition of melodrama, which film scholar Rabbi Vasudevan has narrated as a form of storytelling that formulates subjectivities that are at once personal, intimate, and public. More specifically, the spectacular is a strategic, and I'm arguing often cynical appropriation of the melodrama and its ability to twine the intimate and the public. Let us also be clear that the spectacle as we are defining it here, this is crucial for me, makes specific allusions to the nation and capital as affective concepts. The spectacle defines a concept, idea, or belief as transcendental. In other words, as outside the bounds and limits of the mundane tasks of meaning making and analysis. There's no argument that Mugambo is evil. Um, as such, it connotes an irrefutability to the concept or belief. Mogambo's villainous deeds, land grabbing, violence engulfing neighborhoods, the exploitation of the poor, and the violent extraction of surplus value feel real. These can be analyzed and a critique can be formulated through that analysis, but Mogambo himself does not look or sound real. He signifies evil and that evilness is irrefutable because it transcends the limits of analysis. His unreal sensational persona makes him memorable as a character. His antithesis is the spectacular Mr. India. To be read as the embodiments of good and evil, Mugambo and Mr. India must be larger than life, which means they must transcend the conventions of meaning making that require the reader, the listener, the viewer to complete the chain of signification. At the same time, in order for Mugambo and Mr. India to be affective signs, they must not be rendered as abstractions. Instead, Mugambo and Mr. India are authoritatively defined as good and evil through the spectacle. As a narrative form, spectacular realism combines and deliberately entangles realism 
with its emphasis on ethnographic and sociological detail with a sensationalist masala or melodrama of the spectacular. Realism provides the warrant for the authority of the spectacle. To put it differently, the spectacle rests on the foundation provided for it by realism. While narrative form has typically been studied in the context of film and literature, my book tracks the form of spectacular realism within political and economic discourse as well, which reveals to us the ways in which nation and capital are narrated as transcendentally given authoritarian uh, conceptions backed by the analytical weight of the real domino. So let us then consider another instantiation um, or expression of the form of spectacular realism, this time from the arena of party politics. In 1992, five years after the release of Mr. India, the Hindu nationalist movement destroyed a 16th century mosque in the Northern Indian city of Ayodhya. The demolition triggered anti-Muslim pogroms throughout the nation. As scholars such as Arvind Raj Gopal have showed, uh, various mobilization strategies were used by different Hindu nationalist groups in the 1980s to galvanize a public that culminated in the demolition of the mosque. One key mobilization strategy was the Rath Yatra, or Journey by Chariot, undertaken by L.K. Advani, a senior and seasoned political leader of the BJP. The chariot is a significant symbol within Hindu mythology, particularly within the stories that are a part of the epic Mahabharata. Here, Krishna, described as an avatar of Vishnu, designated as the creator in the Hindu trinity of gods and worshipped as a god himself, takes on the role of a charioteer during the climactic battle scenes of the epic and renders a set of arguments about morality, ethics, and creation itself. Those arguments have circulated as the Bhagavad Gita, which has been defined as one of the central texts of Hinduism by British colonialists, native elites, and by Hindu nationalists. Within this narrative, Krishna is both common as the mere charioteer and spectacular. He reveals himself as the supreme transcendental power of God himself. During the Rath Yatra, the chariot and its representation within the Mahabharata was yoked to the symbolism associated with the second significant epic in the Hindu pantheon, namely the Ramayana, which narrates the story of Ram as a morality tale. The Rath Yatra as a performative event and a tool for political mobilization used this accreted symbolism of the chariot and was designed as a spectacle. A Toyota minibus was dressed to look like a chariot. The discourse of Hindu nationalism has consistently described the cities of Somnath, Ayodhya, Kashi, and Mathura as holy temple cities for the followers of Hinduism that were deliberately desecrated by quote-unquote Muslim kings or Mughal emperors like Aurangzeb and Babur. The BJP's chariot traveled from Somnath in the Western Indian state of Gujarat to the Northern Indian state of Ayodhya, thus tracing the geography of wounded Hindu pride as narrated by the discourse of Hindu nationalism. Writing his memoir over a decade after the Rath Yatra and the demolition of the mosque, L.K. Advani linked the spectacle of uh, the Hindu nation complete with the narration of a king who embodied morality itself mm -hmm. and an epic battle between invaders and the nation defined as bounded space and culture with the mass of real Indians, namely the Hindus. The Rath Yatra was a performative instantiation of this linkage. Through the symbolism of the chariot, Advani and the BJP demanded that the, that the Rath Yatra be read as more than a political rally and instead as a spectacle in which the Hindu nationalist movement sought to define the Hindu nation as irrefutable. What is also significant for our purposes here is the manner in which the spectacle twined the intimate with the public. In Advani's narration of the experience, people came out to see, greet, and pay obeisance to the chariot. They were less interested in the political agenda of the BJP and its particular stake in the temple mobilization. This reverential and curious interest in the chariot is narrated by Advani as the reality of popular common Hinduism. The chariot, argues Advani, and I quote, acquired divinity as a consequence of a popular form of Hindu worship through which common people see the manifestation of the divine in any idol or object, a tree, a mountain, a river, or a lake, etc., that they believe is sanctified, end quote. Using this, quote unquote, deep-rooted religiosity that is intimate in the sense that it is a relationship between an individual and community and an object, the Rath Yatra, twined it with the public, that is a particular discourse of nationalism. 
Advani notes that although the people's response to the Rath Yatra was mainly religious, the focus of his speeches was on nationalism. Defining the Rath Yatra's public reverence as the reality of the common Hindu, it was also then twined with the spectacle and the mythic symbolism of the chariot and thus to the Hindu nation by the story told by Hindu nationalism. This story of the Rath Yatra as told by Hindu nationalism relies on the character of the common Hindu. So this is what realism is, this is real, to narrate the spectacle of the Hindu nation. To be clear, the common Hindu is a character within the story told by Hindu nationalism and as such as realistic as Arun Burma from Mr. India. So let me now tell you a third story. Um, in the summer of 2008, the Indian parliament debated and voted on an India-US civil nuclear cooperation initiative. This nuclear deal, as it has come to be called, is a significant element of the form neoliberalism has taken in India. It is also central to the story of development, something I track in the first chapter of the book. The India-US uh, agreement resulted in India separating its civil and military nuclear facilities, subsequently placing its um, civil nuclear facilities under safeguards instituted by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And more significantly, it hoped to increase India's nuclear power generation in which the US expected to have a share through the purchase of reactors from nuclear vendors in the US and elsewhere, and the transfer of equipment and technology. The debate that took place in the Indian parliament became a media spectacle. The speeches, some witty, some acerbic, some passionate, some dull, made in parliament were telecast live on English and Hindi language television. This was followed by lively commentary, interviews, a rebroadcast of some of the best speeches and discussion. Political parties on the left, such as the Communist Party of India and the Communist Party of India Marxist, were vehemently opposed to the agreement and coded their opposition through the citation of the excesses of globalization, the enormous disparities instituted by neoliberalism in India, and by discussing American imperialism. This argument aimed to sketch out the reality of new India and raise the figure of the commoner, the poor worker in urban landscapes, the landless in rural villages, in the hope of arguing that economic opportunity, the alleviation of poverty, and food security were real imperatives that the spectacular story about nuclear technology would not and could not address. Proponents of the agreement in Parliament, most significantly members of the Indian National Congress, also raised the figure of the commoner. In the case of Rahul Gandhi, son of the late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and grandson of another late Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, the figure of the common woman was the sign through which to argue for nuclear technology. Rahul Gandhi, in his speech in parliament, described two women, both Dalit and poor. Shashikala, a landless laborer who had three sons, and Kalavati, who had nine children and whose husband had committed suicide, who argued that the energy security that nuclear technology would provide would work to alleviate the poverty of people like them. Subtly alluding to the then Senator Barack Obama's speech at the Democratic National Convention in 2004, Gandhi said that he had that he had decided to speak not as a member of a political party but as an Indian, and concluded his speech by suggesting that Indians should no longer be worried about how the world would impact them, but instead should focus on how they could and would impact the world. This argument, unlike that of the left parties, twined the commoner with nuclear technology and the spectacular with the real. It was an argument that won the day in parliament. Perhaps even more significantly, it was the story that resonated most powerfully within Indian popular culture. The three stories we've tracked here are located in distinct analytical, disciplinary, and narrative spaces. Mr. India within popular cinema, the Rath Yatra in real politics, political science and history, and the nuclear deal debate within political economy. But all three share a narrative form that of spectacular realism. Literary critics have argued the narrative form is an ideological act in its own right with the function of inventing Im imaginary or formal solutions to unresolvable social contradictions. In other words, ideology does not proceed and then invest and inform symbolic production. Rather, the aesthetic act is itself ideological. The story of our time is a story about spectacular realism. To reiterate, in the story of Hindutva neoliberalism, the spectacle of capital and the nation is suited to the realism of the commoner in order to win consent for the conjuncture. In the story of Hindutva neoliberalism, the spectacular requires realism. 
stories are unstable scripts, however. And so one of the things I do in, in the chapters is even as I track the story, the story of the intersection of neoliberalism with Hindu nationalism, I also trace the contours of an unruly story or what I'm calling an unruly story. The, this unruly story is a narrative that does not quite follow the semiotic and affective logic of the story. It speaks in a different cadence sometimes. It can function as a deconstructive lever, unraveling the story of spectacular realism sometimes. And at other times, it employs the world make, its world-making function to point to the shape of a world undefined by neoliberalism and Hindu nationalism. So I want to conclude um, with a reading, this is, this is part of my conclusion, with the reading of the 2015 film Tamasha, or Spectacle. Central to Tamasha's argument, this film's argument, is its conception of realism and the spectacle. Through the book, I track the form of spectacular realism, which performs the discursive labor of suturing the commoner, the arm admi, to the spectacle of capital and authoritarian nationalism. That discursive labor aims to win consent for Hindutva neoliberalism. Tamasha inverts, I'm arguing, the discursive logic of spectacular realism as a form. The film suggests that it is capital and patriarchy that translate and transform our protagonist in the film into the commoner. As such, that commoner is a falsehood, the opposite of realism. The protagonist of the film, the story goes, is powerfully acted upon to play the character of the commoner. Enacting that character is a traumatic experience, a trauma that is staged and experienced every single day. In order to unshackle himself from the trauma of living a lie, our protagonist must find realism. This brings us to the binary of heart world, Dil Dunya, that Tamasha's plot sets up for its protagonist. To unshackle himself from the lie that the world is enforced upon him, he must turn to the heart. Or to find his happily ever after, he must find the heart. But what is the heart? What does it want? If Ved, our protagonist, is caught between the heart and the world, and if the world, that is dunya, is the dominant story, the story of capital, then the heart, or dil, appears to be the symbol for the story that does not labor to reproduce capital. Thus, the dil-dunya binary would suggest that where dunya, or the dominant story, is the history mapped out by capital, dil, the story that the heart spins, is that which in interrupts dunya and creates an unease in our protagonist. In dunya, our protagonist is a commoner in groveling service of capital and patriarchy. He mouths the jargon of the corporation and is asked to be an individual, even as he is simultaneously told to be a cog in the wheel. In the world, he must be his father's son and capital's knave, displaying his unique selling point, USP, at all times. As such, Ved in the world labors to reproduce the very structures and institutions that alienate him from himself. But like Ved, we must circle back to the question that continues to elude a response. What exactly is the heart? Is it a mirage, as Ved suggests at one point in the narrative, that appears restorative like water but is actually parched like sand? Is it the lover standing, beckoning from a distance? Is the heart a space outside the bounds of capital and patriarchy? Does it always already exist? Does it require discovery? Having set up the Dil Dunya binary, Tamasha does a curious thing. It aims to sidestep and bracket the bipolarity of binaries. Tamasha suggests that the self that is not alienated from itself, the real self, does not simply exist as the polar opposite, as an essence of the dominant story. It must be crafted through careful storytelling. It must be constituted through a journey of deliberately asked questions, safar nama savalonka. There is nothing unselfconscious about the heart. This journey of question answer, call and response that our protagonist must undertake in order to construct the story of the heart also reveals to him that the world is in fact a hegemonic story. It is not an immovable reality, but a powerfully constructed imperative. It must consistently work to win consent. If dunya is a story that becomes hegemonic because it is told, retold and circulated in myriad different ways, then dil is a story too. Moreover, it is a story that reveals the world's mythologies and must also therefore be narrated, re-narrated and circulated. In order to draft this story, our protagonist must give up on the certainty, certainties, including the certainties of binaries, promised by capital and patriarchy. 
along the way, he meets people who do not conform to binaries. A rickshaw driver who is a singer, a wise hijra who begs at the traffic light, who act as uncanny intuitions and confirmations of the impossibility of binaries. Ved must surrender to the spectacular joys and sorrows of love. He must also allow himself to become a spectacle, a tamasha. The spectacle, tamasha, the film suggests, helps unravel the tangled web of the hegemonic story. And that deconstruction in turn can lead to the constitution of a self that is not alienated from itself, and that is realism. In the narrative logic of the film, realism requires the spectacular. In the hegemonic story of Hindutva neoliberalism that we've been tracking, capital and authoritarian nationalism are constituted as spectacular, and the commoner or the amadmi is constituted as realism. That which is spectacular is then cynically sutured to that which is real. So that consent can be one for Hindutva neoliberalism. In the narrative logic of these stories, the spectacular requires realism. Popular stories from film, advertising, journalism, and commentary provide the paradigmatic structure through which the political economic formation of Hindutva neoliberalism narrates itself. Spectacular realism emerges as an aesthetic form of Hindutva neoliberalism through the patterning of a diverse range of stories. In the hegemonic form of spectacular realism, uh, uh, authority and authoritarianism often enact the spectacle, and a patrilineal relationship sutures realism to the spectacle. In the film Tamasha, popular stories are crucial to our protagonist. That's the, the poster, the, the male protagonist and the female protagonist are in the foreground. The background is images drawn from the, the many mythologies um, uh, that, and stories that, that have been a part of our protagonist's life. Okay? Um, popular stories in Tamasha are crucial to our protagonist. He has listened to stories and popular myth, myths through his childhood. He used to, in fact, seek out a storyteller so he could hear those stories drawn from literature and mythology from all over the world in all their various situations. Listening to those stories makes our protagonist a storyteller too. He is attuned to the many stories swirling around him. He hears the patterns and the intersections among those stories. And he's a listener first, narrator second. He can play with storylines, merging, blending, and mixing plot lines that the world categorizes as disparate and incommensurable. Because he is playful, is enabled to be playful in the story of the heart, there are no limits. He can move like the sky, like thought itself, asman hai, khayal hai. Uh, a song in the uh, in the film goes. Here he doesn't have to struggle to find his USP and market himself convincingly. He is without precedent, without parallel, be missal, just like everyone else. In the hard story, moreover, he's never alone. And this is important. Uh, this is an important argument for me. In the hard story, he's never alone or lonely. It is only because he listens that he can narrate and only because he is called can he respond. Here he lives within a collective, quite specifically a theater group, which includes the rickshaw driver singer, even his lover sometimes, among many others. He's not a lone writer or a lonely photographer consuming the world through his lens. He crafts his stories within the experience of collectivity afforded by theater, a form some have argued that is different from every other popular cultural form because it is not constituted by the processes of mechanical reproduction. What he creates with his theater group is a tamasha, a theatrical, a theatrical spectacle. That tamasha crafts and tells the story of the heart by narrating the hegemonic story of the world. In doing so, it links the heart with the world, the intimate with the public, the particularly local with the globally universal. The spectacle of love and the staging of spectacles allows our protagonist to eschew the bipolarity of heart and world, dil or dunya. The popular story, but especially that playing with, the, with both the form and the content of the popular story is crucial to the protagonist's understanding of the world as a hegemonic story and to the crafting of his own. Um, so let me play um, just a few, what time, what is the time? Okay, we'll, <laughs> your time. Yeah, we'll um, let me play just a, this is, um, this film, and we can talk about it if anyone's interested. It has a it has a cult following. It has been read in multiple different ways, completely contrary to the way I have just read it, <laughs> read it as well. Um, but anyway, so I found this link um, 
because it is a, such a cult film, uh, I found this, uh, it didn't make money, but it's it's got a cult following. Um, I found this link uh, that somebody has put up with an English translation. It's not the best, but it, you know, it'll do the, it'll do the job, I think. So um, just maybe just a few lines of this. Make, make the screen big, man. Yeah. Jahan 
Thank you for listening patiently. That was maybe too long. It's so crazy to be, as you said before, in person doing this, right? Because we've been practicing yes. on Zoom for yes. so long. Yes. So, um, <laughs> um, and I, I want to recognize that there are, are so many people here who might also want to just ask questions. So uh, in our little scheme that we invented, I was going to ask some questions, so I will. Um, but then also we'll, yeah. we'll obviously open up so people can can enjoy with us and um, we'll get to the celebration part, don't worry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, I just, I want to, I want to thank you for this book, which I, I read for, I guess, the second time in, in preparing for today. And I realized that I had read it, I guess, differently before doing different things with it. Mm. And, and in coming to it for today, I really wanted to think about um, some of what really was in your biography about mm. where you were, mm. right, before starting this. And, mm. and the reason I say this is because uh, the study of popular culture, as you and I have talked about before, has has really been, um, in some ways, unfortunately transformed mm. in the contemporary moment, very much along the lines of the neoliberalism that you described, mm -hmm. where um, objects that are popular are often treated as if they're high cultural objects mm -hmm. and can both bear the same forms of scrutiny mm -hmm. and and then also are um, can be analyzed with the same modalities that those um, are, are 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 analyzed with mm -hmm. and your this text which I mean it's deceptively thin as a book, um, uh, as someone pointed out to me earlier, it does have small print, but it's not only that. Um, it's actually that, um, as you revealed today, and as you, you linked these three different stories, that the, the complex argument of producing the notion of a spectacular form, mm -hmm. which both has these um, differences inside of it, mm -hmm. but at the same time still functions, um, requires a really uh, complex series of arguments. So I, I just wanted to mm -hmm. underscore the thinking, which I think all of us can actually witness here in, in listening to this talk today, um, how much you've read, mm -hmm. how much you are forced to translate yourself mm -hmm. into a, kind of US-centered audience mm -hmm. to write for Rutgers University Press for this, and to write at this particular moment about contemporary works. And, and I I happen to think um, that sometimes we uh, don't acknowledge how difficult it is to write about the present moment. Mm -hmm. and, and you have done that um, by trying to um, pay attention to the various different areas where you find your stories mm. and yet not collapsing one into the other. Mm. And so I like the way you set up your talk for today, which I didn't hear in advance, by the way. So um, <laughs> because you you move from the, I believe, 1987 film, right, to the yeah. 2015 mm -hmm. film. And and you are then marking, demarcating a particular period for us, um, which obviously you're also experiencing mm. um, as an Indian citizen, but also in, in the US, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. So I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how some of your influences, like Stuart Hall seems incredibly yeah. necessary uh, for you. Yeah. And I, I um, would venture to say he'd be pleased by the way in which you not only use his work, but model your work on some of the aspects of his work that he felt were most crucial. Mm. Um, and by that, I am referring back to the, the layering yeah. that, you, um, that you are attending to and the various ways in which you are not trying to um, uh, sediment identities, mm. but rather constantly revealing um, the uh, motility mm -hmm. and yet the mm. ways that these stories nonetheless uh, can still have the label of a spectacular form. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about both your, maybe your background as a journalist, mm -hmm. um, and then how you came to study um, the theories applied to popular culture, and then how that um, led to your book. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also just interested in maybe tacking onto that, mm -hmm. what it meant for you to be writing this book, Living in the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. That's, I know it's like a lot. Yeah, so yeah, no, no, that's great. Um, so let me 
um, that, that's, um, maybe I'll tell, well, one story and, uh, uh, why, you know, the journalism, that's, it's, I've always said this, I've said this um, in the classroom, I've, you know, um, said it often when I'm presenting my work, it, the, in these bios, <laughs> right, uh, that, 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 it was a brief period, really, in terms of, you know, temporality, it's a, it was a brief period, uh, and it feels like a different lifetime, um, but, uh, it, it was a. It was really crucial uh, in shaping the the kinds of um, the <laughs> kinds of questions that have then um, given shape and form to this to this book. I came to journalism um, wanting, thinking that writing and reporting would <laughs> enable me to. Um, understand the worlds within which I resided better. But what I, in fact, got from that experience was, um, was, was, uh, was, under, was an understanding about the limits of narratives, you know, the, 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 the everyday, the mundane task of writing a story, you know, a 500, uh, 800 word story every single day, you know, going out and talking to people um, uh, or covering a particular event or going to a press conference or, or watching a film and, you know, and, and having to come back and in, in, within the, the space of a few hours, you know, put this, put this story together made me, um, made me realize that, made me realize the limits, you know, of, um, of the processes through which um, uh, narratives are produced, right? The, and, and that there are, there are structural um, um, foreclosure, structural limits, you know, to the ways in which we can, um, we can express and, and represent. And of course, there are individual limits, you know, but, but there are, but there are, uh, there are distinct limitations, you know, to, um, so one story there, you know, one of the, um, I wrote as, as a journalist uh, for this, working for this uh, newspaper, um, along with um, some of my colleagues, including Junaid, actually, uh, we wrote a series of stories on the demise of uh, the textile mills in um, in Bombay City uh, during this time. Um, this is, you know, the the textile mills um, in Bombay. Um, are, are a symbol of what of of uh, what Bombay has come to stand for, right? In the in the um, in the popular story that is told about India, it, it's the textile mills that, uh, in part, that you know that um, enable Bombay to be defined as an industrial city. Um, and so the demise of the mills was not just the demise of a particular kind of industry; it is the demise of, or it is the it is a shift. Um, the, the the working class neighborhoods, you know, around which which grew out, which grew around uh, these these mills uh, have shifted and changed. Um, so th this was a, you know, this was this was a radical shift that was that was basically taking place um, right before our eyes, right? And um, and we had to again in the contemporary moment in present time write about it. Um, and uh, and I would this this one particular so it was a series of stories, but this one particular story I remember in particular. Um, as I went, you know, a number of the mill workers in, in, in different mills were staging different kinds of protests. Um, and their demands were, were actually, their voiced demands were very basic, which is they were, they were seeking a, they were seeking a better, um, the rhetoric was keep the mills open, but what they were seeking, what they were in fact seeking was a better voluntary retirement package, right? So this thing about voluntary retirement, you know, they're, they're, they're being forced into retirement and they would, they would be given a lump sum amount of money. That lump sum lasts for about a couple of years, you know, two or three years at the most. But they were seeking, in effect, a better voluntary retirement package. The rhetoric was, you know, keep the mills open. Um, but the... So there, there were different kinds of protests. One of these protests that I went to and then wrote a story about, I, I, uh, that, this is what I mean by the distinct kind of narrative limits that, that are, that are, um, uh, that, 
you know, that are in fact encoded within these narratives themselves. The story I ended up writing, I realized, right, presented these workers as despondent, um, you know, even though, even though this was not necessarily, this was a part of the story, it was not the full story, but it was, but it's what came out most predominantly in the story that I wrote about them, right, that they were despondent, it was just, this was a sort of hopelessness, you know, in the, um, about this time. Yeah. Um, and this, these experiences, this, this story in particular, but many, um, and many experiences during this time when I was working, uh, when I was a reporter, made me want to think more, you know, about stories, um, the processes through which stories are written, um, like what kinds of, um, you know, how, how do we, um, nobody is, you know, what it also distinctly showed to me, nobody was, no editor, uh, no chief of bureau was sitting behind, you know, was breathing down my neck saying, you need to write the story in exactly this way, you need to frame it in this way. Nobody did that. And yet I wrote, I was framed, right? And my, my job, I was free, yes, I was free and I was framing, right? I wrote these stories that were, that were, I mean, they were more or less in line, right? With the, with the hegemonic story, right? So, so that's the, um, that's the story. That's the that, that's the experience that I wanted to make more sense of, um, and then the the um, and that's that's entirely kind of you know that's a huge sort of uh, motivational. It's the question that has stayed with me in the writing of the book. Um, uh, I I often felt like I, I mean I I I really in some ways wrote this book to help me understand what you know it was it's it's it was for an audience of one um uh, so this is also why it feels nerve-wracking now that it's out <laughs> in the world um but it was yeah it was written it was almost like this diary you know that i was writing to uh, to make sense of these questions that have stayed with me um for for a couple of decades at least and um this is why i began the talk also with you know, being a teenager in the 1990s, and these these were these are the questions that have that have stayed with me. The the Stuart Hall um, and the that's the other story that I've told in a in a small piece I've published elsewhere. Um, I found Stuart Hall. I like telling this story. I found Stuart Hall in the British Council Library, right, um, in in Bombay City. Now the British Council Library is a vestige sign symbol of British colonialism in you know different parts of the third world right um it 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 stands there it is like it was where I mean it's gone now <laughs> because we're in a different time but it it used to be it's a library like no other it's air conditioned you know the the librarians are you beautiful in their beautiful saris you know speaking the queen's english um so when you entered the british council library you knew that you're entering the space of high culture right that this is you know it's the it's the um it's the these it's the keats and the and the byrons and the shakespeare's and the you know uh, and everybody else right um this is literature this is literature with the capital l this is what you should be reading right um um and um and and it's what we i mean it's it's what we we internalized and we would we would go and read there but it's it's also in that space that I found Stuart Hall, you know, in this little shelf called media and something, media and society or something. And there was Stuart Hall. And it was, it was, it was this essay, The Whites of Our Eyes, or you know, it's this. So it was incredible. I mean, I saw that this was a time when at which this is why I ended up at that little shelf media, because I was thinking about journalism. Yes. <laughs> so uh, right. Um uh, and, and so. Um, uh, and and it, it's where I found Stuart Hall. So I, you know, the title seemed um, seemed so interesting, and I and I read him, and I couldn't put him down um, because. Uh, and then I was, you know, reintroduced to Hall much later in graduate school again. So this was this was again when I was a teenager is when I found him first uh, in the British Council Library. But what Hall and the Birmingham School um, 
for me, this is why they've been, it's that work has been central. Um, uh, and it's why I want to be in conversation with them is precisely because of, of what you were saying, Gina, which is, you know, the, the ways in which Hall and the Birmingham School, or particularly Hall's version of the, of the Birmingham School, poses these questions about political economy and culture without collapsing the these these um, uh, you know these instances together the social the cultural the economic and the political um, and and is able to to um, it, it, it sort of, at my, in my first reading, very intuitively Hall spoke to me about, um, or, or Hall coincided with some of my intuitions, right, about the importance and the centrality of the popular cultural story um, and, and its entanglement, right, with, with larger questions of, of political economy. And so um, even as I have sort of, um, you know, meandered along different intellectual trajectories, and uh, um, I have, I've, I think I've always come back, um, come back home. Uh, you know, to to uh, the Birmingham School or to Hall. Um, Preeti, I think, who's who's uh, who's uh, logged in there. Preeti was one of my advisors uh, when I was a doctoral student. had um, had called him my mentor theorist, which I always, <laughs> I've always liked that that phrase. Um, uh, but, you know, but not to, again, not to sort of, uh, I don't want to deify Stuart Hall or, you know, uh, turn him into this authoritarian figure or, or, or something, but it's the openings, right, that, um, uh, and provocations, I think, that Hall uh, was uh, made possible that, that, again, enabled me to um, it enabled me to ask the questions that I wanted to ask in the ways that I wanted to ask them. I think that that's, um, that's what, um, you know, it, the Birmingham School's version of cultural studies has made possible for me. Um, yeah, is that? Yes, yeah. <laughs> but can I, um, can I, I know that who has questions also would like to get in here. So I want to make sure we get okay. So I'm just going to say one more thing, and then we can we can open up. Yes. Because, um, because the the last little bit of pressure I'd love to to put in mm. is on um, something that I know you and I have talked about in various ways over time, and and one of the reasons why Hall was important in in the lead up to this is just the way that the Birmingham School arrived to the U.S. and and U.S. cultural studies has kind of rejected a lot of the what yeah. you have tried to hold on to, yeah. I wanted to, to point out. And then yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, which is the, what I tacked on to the first question, um, to think about writing from here and, and right. your work as translation in a way yeah. and, and around certain questions. Yeah. Um, so there's so many terms that you're, you're using that are familiar to all of us, but you're using in a very in a particular way and you're trying to get us to understand yeah. as mostly non-Indians who are probably going to be reading this, yeah. you know, how to think about neoliberalism, for example, yeah. but but not in, in the same way we recognize it, right? Or to think also about class and and gender, mm. but to add uh, religion and caste mm. in a different way. Mm. Um, I, I couldn't help but hear so many resonances of things that are familiar from Black experience, which are also somewhat in, in your book, but mm -hmm. about the invisible man, this whole, this whole mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. mechanistic structure that can actually allow mm -hmm. him to be um, uh, invisible, but in a very different historical moment, right. in a different situation. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought it'd be good for, for everyone to hear just a little bit yeah. Yeah. about, about you know, I, I'm thinking now, for example, and I'm about the book called Cast mm. that that was published. Isabel Wilkerson, I no. just forgot the name. Yeah, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Last... No. I know that's why I'm raising it. Yeah. yeah, I'm saying you know, there's a lot going around using terms mm -hmm. that appear to be the same, mm. but I think it's really important to say out loud mm. maybe why those translations don't work so well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and what in particular you're trying to tell us mm -hmm. about how caste is functioning mm -hmm. about how religious difference is functioning mm -hmm. but also um that 
you know, so many of the stories that you tell have to do with this kind of invitation to a newly formed middle class, mm -hmm. which is emerging, mm -hmm. which is part of the story. And so I just wanted, before we open up further, mm -hmm. to, to, to put a finer point okay. on some of that. Yeah. So I think the way I'll, um, yeah, and I didn't answer that question about that's writing okay. from here, right? But, but, it's, but that's important, actually. And I, I think the way, maybe the way I'll answer this question is to... Um, uh, is is to say that you know one of the things I I try to do in my actually in my acknowledgements page right is to tell this story of um, uh, acknowledgement section is to tell that story about the the sort of intellectual trajectory which has allowed me and which is which is that intellectual trajectory is very particular. It, it, it comes together as a consequence of a number of contingent factors. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and the um, contingent factors, certain individual particular factors, uh, both to do with um, me, but also my relationships with, with uh, people um, and institutions. Um, so, I, you're absolutely right, Gina, right? So the way that um, the, I mean, this is again, why I have always um, centered and when I teach, I keep saying, you know, the way I am talking about cultural studies here, I'm talking about the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies. This is a very particular instantiation of culture um, and cultural work, right? And um, because it is not how cultural studies was taken up in the US, right? Um, uh, necessarily, and I am, uh, while I might be in conversation with some of that, that is, um, it, it, that has not been as, um, significant, right, to my own, uh, to my own journey, because I, because I was trained in, in communication, and because my, um, which is, you know, which is this, again, this broad interdisciplinary field, and because my advisors allowed me, gave me the space um, to, to really craft my own program, um, which allowed me to, to turn to Black cultural studies. It allowed me to turn to women of color feminisms. It allowed me to turn to literature and literary theory. It allowed me to turn to cultural geography, right? Um, it, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it allowed me to turn to, um, again, very particular sorts of um, uh, work uh, within, again, this broad category of South Asia studies um, that, uh, uh, that that uh, that that it's that intellect it's those sets of contingent factors right that that very particular um, kind of trajectory that I think you see um, um, you know in in narrative form in in the book um, so so this is why I mean I'm I, I'm um, I'm at pains to say in the introduction um, I, I I try and hit back at this and you know in in the different chapters as well I try to make this point um, uh, sometimes I feel like it's just an argument in my own head but you know but I try to make this point at the job talk too that I am not I am completely disinterested in reading uh, culture or popular culture in these binaristic ways, you know, as ideology or resistant. I am completely uninterested in, I am, what I am uh, centrally interested in, in the book is to think about the stories which constitute the people as the people, right? Um, I, I do not, you know, the, the people come together in, uh, come together as a category, right? Um, uh, as a constitution of this quilting together of different kinds of stories. And those, and that quilting together is is ideological work you know it it when when the people it's a historical work as well so you know what what becomes categorized as the people right she shifts and ch it changes and i try to track some of that um you know in this um uh at least in this you know uh, within this small time period that I'm working with, the more contemporary time period. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm uninterested, uh, uh, not just that I'm uninterested, I'm critical of the, the move um, of turning to 
you know people's stories um and, and then and then um and then you know using those those stories as a mode of critique right of of sort of larger uh, ideological structures because that is precisely what what um, this is the argument that the book is trying to make this is precisely what capital is doing this is precisely what uh, hindu nationalism is doing what authoritarian nationalism is doing um and unless we have an understanding of um of the processes through which right the people are raised as the people right um uh, you know um we, we're not going to be able to work out this this you know this uh, an effective enough critique um and the location i think it's um first of all writing about the contemporary moment is very very difficult because it's a moving target you know <laughs> uh things keep shifting and changing um uh you know this i i, I mean the um, uh, i had never thought uh, why would i because this film was wasn't made right uh, i would i would have never thought that i would use a 2015 film that there would be a 2015 film called the masha called the spectacle right which i could then actually use um uh, so so you know it's one it's a movie target but also um it's uh, writing from the from from the us has been both um um there there are certain productive aspects of it right um it has allowed me for instance i think to um to uh, uh, to have to be a part of certain sets of conversations um i think particularly around race or or you know or black cultural studies um that i might not have, have been a part of you know writing writing from india um uh, so there are i think there are there are some um there have been some deeply productive aspects to writing from a distance um writing from the us and then there are distinct limitations of course right um uh you know which um i mean which we can we can talk about but uh, yeah there are there are distinct limitations it is uh, you know it is Yeah, it's the there is i mean i'll i just say simply that there is always a deep anxiety about sort of not knowing enough you know um uh, not being um yeah just not knowing enough you know um uh, or 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 having a certain skimming the surface you know be just just literally just skimming the surface um uh, and that is an anxiety but i again i tried to use that i i you know i might not always succeed certainly but but i've tried to use that anxiety in productive ways you know um and so um so i would say for me it's it's a it's both it can be both productive and then there are distinct limits from writing from from a distance i want to let others in yeah not yeah. on your people radhika <laughs> yeah uh thank you so much mom it was just uh, it was so wonderful to listen to you i am so happy for you i'm so excited that you're here to stay um <laughs> <laughs> i think you all knew that <laughs> Oh I see I'm sorry I didn't make the connection. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um so of course I'm uh, you know picking up on the word stories a lot right now coming from you know having studied literature for far too long. Yes. Um uh, but but I and I'm sort of really appreciating right now particularly how much the word the word story is kind of you know liberates us from from, from for example the word narrative. Mm. um and and mm-hmm. so you know you've talked about modes of storytelling you've talked about you know realism as mode of storytelling the spectacular how you know one is perhaps being instrumentalized by the other mm. depending on what story is being told um you've also talked about i mean if i think about all the stories that went into the tamasha the idea of the tamasha yeah. the myth um you know uh the, the myth epics legend all sort of different kinds of stories that went into that mm. um also thinking about you know you mentioned writing your diary and and then i'm thinking about you know, your journalistic works so writing stories for that mm. uh, then of course there's the idea of you know just like story telling a story or making a story for yourself that element of morality to it mm-hmm. so there's like so much sort of richness feeding into the mm. this, the word story becomes so capacious, capacious here for uh-huh. us and and so i just want to hear a little bit more about you know how you know how how that i mean i'm trying to think about how that works for you mm. and i guess i'm also thinking about you know your your sort of modes of perhaps gathering stories so 
it's not just kind of popular stories that have been told, but I'm wondering if it, there was kind of a process of also um, listening to stories that haven't kind of, uh, that are not, you know, popular in the way that Tamasha is perhaps. Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah, what was that mode of kind yeah. of editing and gathering? Yeah. So the, um, uh, the, you know, again, to, uh, I'm, I'm linking um, uh, the question that Gina asked, actually. So I think it's the, the, the with, with your question, Radhika, the, the settling on this concept story, I think, has a lot to do with my journalistic experience as well, right? Um, because there we write stories. I mean, you you know, you're, you're, what's your, go write that story, right? You know, and, um, and uh, so that's one, that's a quick answer. But, <laughs> but then yeah. precisely for the many reasons that you just are beautifully articulated, um, story, and again, this is here's where, again, I'm connecting to, uh, connecting uh, this back to Gina's question as well. Um, story rather than narrative, rather than discourse even, you know, which I think for the longest time I was using the term in various iterations, I used the term discourse, you know, um, but I, but the, but rather than narrative, rather than discourse, the term story, the concept story, the way that I am, uh, right, um, uh, uh, defining it here, the way that you, you know, just talked about it here, um, seemed to me to be the most productive way in which I could um, weave together these many different stories, right? Um, that, that was always the, the, the goal or the aim was to, um, uh, was to put popular stories um, in conversation with stories that are told, right, uh, in the in the space of the political, in the space of the economic, um, uh, and to reveal the resonances, not just to put them in conversation, but to actually reveal the resonances, which you know, which uh, which I thought were there, um, and so that's. Th that's the work I think that the concept story, um, at least I think, enables me to do. Yeah, um, and the way I went to the collection of stories. So that's you know that again that is um, that's really um, I should have a I should prepare a better answer for that <laughs> for that question. Um, but I there were. Um, this is partly why, again, I began this talk with that personal story, right? There were things I wanted to write about. Um, I wanted to write about Hindu nationalism. I wanted to write about um, the form of neoliberalism in, in India. Um, but then what is neoliberalism? And so then I wanted to break it down, right? Um, I wanted to talk about... Um, development which had become this uh, you know buzzword right uh, you know uh, in in, um, in 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 india uh, i wanted to talk about uh, caste um, uh, i wanted to talk about um, uh, you know again with with neoliberalism this this uh, this uh, the rise of the entrepreneur right or the or the new middle class you know in in particular kinds of ways so there were there were um, you know, over the course of of, uh, of of research, reading, you know, uh, various kinds of drafting, I, I settled on particular particular sets of thematics that I wanted to write about, and then I sort of um, uh, went about collecting as openly and as broadly as I possibly could uh, stories that told that narrated. Um, something about you know all of these uh, different um, concepts that I was interested in. So the development chapter, for instance, um, the first chapter, you know, it 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 talks about um, it talks about the Mandal two protests. You know, it talks about the caste uh, uh, based affirmative action. Um, protests against those um, those kinds of affirmative action policies. It talks about the nuclear deal um, and and um, the nuclear uh, tests in more in much greater detail. Um, it talks about it talks about a couple of films, right? Uh, um, it talks about um, I'm even forgetting. It talks about the uh, the story that the World Bank told, right, about equity. And, and development and how that got taken up within mainstream English
commentary, you know, in uh, uh, in in Indian public uh, culture. Um, so it's so. I, all of these things, right? Um, all of these different stories that I had collected, um, you know, over the years, um, I realized we're saying something about that concept image or what I'm calling concept image of development, right? And um, and and so, so I think I to the answer again to the question is that there were there were specific. Um, there were specific thematics that I wanted to write about, uh, which I thought was central to our contemporary experience, um, uh, and and then and then tried to be as as open as as I possibly could be um, in thinking about there are, there are distinct limits, of course, to that openness, but the, there but you know to the, to the kinds of stories that 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 came in to the to the picture. Um, but yeah, this is the first. I, I also think I, I will I will formulate a better answer to that question. Uh, this is the first iteration of this book talk, um, and so, uh, but I want to have a better uh, because there is a better answer. You know, there is this uh, to that to that question um, of how these how I went about collecting these stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you for that question. I also want to say thank you so much for talking about writing and translation because I think. I mean, yeah, I think that will resonate for a lot of us. Yeah. Um, for me, just now, for a lot of Okay. Yeah, we can. Um, one more, if, yeah. if there is, a, yeah. So we're, we're going to do one more because I know there's at least one person in this room who would like us to get to Kate. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I think uh, I saw one more hand up earlier. I had a question, but I mean, if that's, I, I don't want to be that, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I know you always that one question. It's fine. Go for it. <laughs> we like it that way. All right. Thanks. It was lovely to listen to you in person after like thinking a little few Zoom calls. Yeah, my. Uh, one question, uh, it's part of, I mean, I have three general questions, but choose two. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's great. Sorry. No, no. I think it's about uh, the realism that you mentioned. Uh, I'm just thinking of, because of like Mr. India and the Tamasha that I mentioned, I was just thinking, Talia, as you were speaking about both of them, also the, uh, the names of the characters and Ved uh -huh. and Arun and all of that, like yeah. so, uh, it passes on to the idea of what you were talking about. Yeah. And also, this is popular cinema. Then when we speak about alternative cinema, mm. I kept thinking about the Vidha of Mani Call mm. from 1972, mm. and then coming back to uh, Paheli, which was done by Sharo, yeah. much later, yeah. which is some mm. for, for me, it's just realism. So uh, yeah, like that, that realism, that is what uh, it kept invoking me. Uh -huh. Uh, like uh, invoking, I, I mean, that was what uh, came back to me in terms of realism because it has this character who's a ghost character who comes back. And, uh, so I was thinking about uh, your uh, spectacular realism in context of Paheli and Dubitha and uh -huh. how it they, they didn't change. It changed a lot when you see Dubitha and Paheli yeah. through film. It's different and different things are. Mm. Uh, because you don't even know who the actors uh, particularly are. They are famous people, but then Shah was doing something like that. Right. right. Those kind of narratives. And then again, uh, attached to that idea of popular cinema, uh, the Rath Yatra, like you play Rahman playing, uh, singing at the end of it, Rishad Kamil uh, wrote the lyrics and all of that. And then Parallelly looking at Rath Yatra, mm. who, which had a background score by Lata Mangeshkar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who won the Bharat Ratna? Like she's like the United Kingdom of India, da da da. But then having that voice back, like the Rathyatra, and keeping it parallel to this song that you played with again, something like having someone from the heart of Hindu nationalism, like from Maharashtra, and then you know, where yeah. all of these are born in some form, the parties and all of that, and Lata Mangeshkar again, and then also that was one other uh -huh. thought, and then. Uh, Narsima Rao and then Modi yeah. are they the outsiders mm -hmm. because he lets it happen as it happened 
yeah. the riots and the, the outside. Yeah. That's the Pilira. Yeah. And, yeah. And also Rao being uh, a Brahmin, Nehru being a Brahmin, and then that outsider mess. Mm. That was not the. And then. Okay, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, later, yeah, no, no. So. Uh, <laughs> I really love how you hope stories also sell up in the beach work. Yeah. I'm not really check it out either. I'm not aware of the work. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh. their work yet. Uh -huh. yes. Uh, no, thank you for those questions. So I, I mean, I'll just say quickly. I am. Uh, so that's interesting. I have. Um, what I'll say quickly is that when I've when I have um, uh, when I have brought in cinema in the book, the book. I mean, I hope the talk didn't suggest that there's there's cinema but there's a lot more yeah. right but whenever i have brought in hindi cinema um mainly uh there's uh, one odd reference to you know another language uh, film but this it's, is now my other question about you know, South Indian cinema. yeah no so it, yeah i i i focused it on uh hindi cinema and and popular mainstream cinema um precisely because the the argument that I'm making is that it is these popular mainstream aesthetics, right, within which um, then the entangled within which these stories of nationalism, Hindu nationalism, and, and neoliberalism are being told. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the only, I think the only kind of um, exception to that, uh, to that uh, uh, rule is um, where in one chapter, the entrepreneur chapter, where I talk about uh, Sham Benegal's Manthan. Yeah, um, and so Manthan would not be Manthan or the churning. Yeah? Um, and it is not a mainstream film. It is not telling a very, though it is wanting to tell a mainstream story, right? It is wanting to put into the mainstream a very particular story, right, about, um, uh, uh, cooperatives and milk cooperatives in particular. Um, but I use Manthan. Um, so again, then rather than rather than be invested in that binary of mainstream and alternative cinema, what I what I what I show with what I try to show with Manthan is that even as Manthan, where of course the actor who plays Mogambo again is the villain, right? In in Manthan, Amrish um, Puri, just in a in a completely in a more much more realistic portrayal, um, right? Um, of this um, uh, ruthless landlord uh, landholder. But um, what what I try to show with Manthan is that even as it attempts to tell this story about the cooperative as a collective, right? As, um, a, a, as a critique of, um, you know, the, uh, uh, that, that, that this collective, that this formation of this cooperative is the, the resistive move, right? This is what will bring um, equity, yeah, um, uh, to uh, these landless uh, villagers, right? Um, it will break the if, uh, the tyranny of feudalism and the feudal relationship that exists between this landholder and the you know and the and the and the villagers, the the landless uh, villagers. It nevertheless, because of its investment in a certain politics of liberalism, mm -hmm. right? It 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 continues to center the possessive individual. So the story of the collective becomes the story of this upper caste man, right? State official who comes and sets up the cooperative for the villagers yeah um and it is his moral upright uprightness his righteousness right that is the 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 moral high ground the moral ground on which that story rests so that's how i've used so rather than again where i have brought in some elements of alternative um uh, cinema it, rather than again work with rather than stay invested in that binary right i've i've tried to think about what again what the intersections are um i haven't seen duvida but i've seen but paheli is very interesting i haven't seen it in a very long time um, and I haven't thought about it in a very long time, so I'm going to go back and uh, and think about it. Was a, it was a very I remember it as being a really 
very interesting film, but I haven't thought about it in a long time. So thank you for that. I'm gonna um, go back to it. And and then the this I wanna emphasize. This is a, this is the clarification. The outsider status is the is the argument that Modi makes, right? It is not the it, Rao is not an outsider <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Nor is Modi an outsider. But that is an argument that that is the story he tells, right, about himself. Um, and so in the book, I talk about you know uh, the whether it's um, Victor Orban, it's uh, Bolsonaro, it's uh, Trump, it's uh, you know it's Modi. They're all telling that same story, which is that you know they they are outsiders to um, and because of these and, and because they are outsiders, they are um, they are common like the people. Right, uh, and that they will therefore uh, come in and you know, uh, um, right, um, shake up, drain the swamp, or you know, uh, do whatever else. Right. Um, so, so the so what I do with the eighties and the this uh, uh, the seventies and the eighties um, in the book is um, is trace a certain kind of narrative through line. Yeah, um, that the the seventies. So this is why the Mister India. Uh, there's the, the one of the core uh, thematics in the book is the angry young man films of the nineteen seventies. So Amitabh Bachchan, right, the working class hero, right, which is the which is the 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 iconic cinematic icon of the of the nineteen seventies. Now that angry young man is is absolutely central to the story that. Modi tells about himself. Modi is the angry young man. He is Amitabh Bachchan of those really of those man. films. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so it is. It's the so so the 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 seven the seventies and the eighties. Um, this is what the the story that I was telling about the, you know, by drawing on the the documents, the cabinet notes, and the. Uh, the the policy documents that were put together that were written in the night in the early so late 1990 late 1980s early mid to late 1980s and the early 1990s these white papers that were written by economists right like Manmohan Singh like Montek Singh Alwalia right right and others Jairam Ramesh and others who these these um, the who were they were so these are you know they're not they're writing in economistic terms right but the the story this is why i sort of dwelled on um narsimha rao's narration in parliament it's important that that happens in parliament uh, of what these reforms are right that establishes so more so rao is not necessarily calling himself an outsider but the narrative that that uh, this narrative of continuity with change linking right um, uh, bringing in caste gender right um, uh, through and then these these sort of patrilineal relationships that were being drawn in that story um, in in my argument becomes central then right uh, to the later stories that come about about neoliberalism so now you the story that's told about economic liberalization of course it completely does away with Nehru, right? Um, which, which for the Congress at the time was it was important to say that this is exactly like Nehru. This is exactly what Nehru had in mind, right? So because the cabinet had a lot of questions, there was a lot of uh, concern and trepidation at the time. So this is we're not doing anything different, you know. This is exactly like the '56 vision. This is that, you know. It's um, but then it became Nehru gets completely dissociated, disassociated, disavowed. Right? It's in fact called the license Raj, right? And the end of the license Raj. But what remains in place is that connection between um, Brahminism, uh, right? Between um, this this kind of um, uh, uh, a certain kind of narrative about masculinity, um, right? The nation, and then uh, economic policy. Yeah, that remains in place. So, so that's that's what I'm um, doing with the with the 70s and the and the 80s is trying to trace that, uh, you know, is that through line. The 70s and the 80s enable them what comes to uh, fruition, right? Uh, in a sense, later, um, in the in really in the last two decades, um, in particular, uh, is the is the argument. Yeah. Thank you.
Sorry, we can't send the cake through to the Zoom <laughs> audience, but thank you for being here. Oh, you're getting flowers. <laughs> um, and thanks for working so hard on your celebration uh, day. No. <laughs> <laughs> but now you get to eat cake. Yes. Or someone does. Oh, that's the best. She wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank 